Hey folks, my name is Constantine. I've been working on Crashlytics for the past uh, seven years or so. And today I'd like to tell you just how difficult and tricky NDK crash handling is. In particular, we'll take a look at what the device does, and then we'll walk through the three major iterations of the Crashlytics NDK SDK. Let's begin by understanding what the device does. When you build your application, libc will install a signal handler. Its purpose is to help you debug your application by providing some useful context, like a stack trace. Here, we have an app whose address space falls somewhere between zero and a bunch of Fs. And wouldn't you know it, this app has a bug. It's a very common bug. It's trying to write a value into the memory address zero, which happens to fall outside of the app's address space. Turns out that the operating system may not be so cool with this, and it tells the app by sending it a POSIX signal, in this case, a SIGSEGV. The consequence of this is that the app's signal handler is invoked. Now, depending on what version of Android the app is running on, the libc signal handler will request a tombstone either from debugger D or crash dump. These are two debugging processes available on Android. One of them will attach to the app in order to p-trace it and unwind the stacks. Stack unwinding is a fairly complex process. Luckily, libraries exist to help. On older Androids, it's libcorkscrew. On newer Androids, it's libunwind. This is a much different process than Java crash handling. An uncaught exception in Java does not crash the JVM. And the JVM keeps track of all the stacks for us. This is neat because inside the uncaught exception handler, we can simply query for all of our stacks. In the native world, the process is in a crash state and nothing keeps track of the stacks for us. One must manually scan the stack memory and use heuristics such as frame pointer walking to try to figure out where the frames are. Uh, once a stack is constructed, one must then figure out what functions and symbols each address corresponds to, a process known as symbolication. So once the debugging process has done its thing, you should see something like this in the logcat. This output shows the stack of the crashed thread and a path to the full tombstone. If your app is released in the Play Store, the corresponding crash report should look very, very similar. Note that the system symbols are present. Just by having the address, one can use the deal adder function to get the symbol name. The on-device unwinder, though, reads the debug information that ships with the system libraries on Android. This debug information is known as dwarf. On a small aside, when we talk about stripped libraries, we're usually referring to a version of the library that does not have the dwarf data. By default, the Android build process will automatically strip all binaries before packaging them into the APK. So the major difference between a stripped and unstripped library is the presence of dwarf data. Notice that a thing called the GNU build ID, which is a unique hash that identifies a particular build of the library, is the same in both versions. This is a critical trait in linking information to a particular build of a binary. Crashlytics, for example, uses this ID to associate symbol files to their respective binaries. Okay, back to our tombstone. Although it's useful, let's take a look at what you really get. Well, you get very accurate system frames. Why? Because system libraries generally do have some dwarf data. It's important to note though that there's no guarantee that system libraries contain any debug info or what type of debug info they contain. There are devices out in the wild that have no debug info in their system libraries. By convention though, there should at least be something called the call frame info. The on-device crash dump process can use this call frame info to fine tune its unwinding heuristics to better calculate the correct frames. What else do you get? Well, unfortunately, the frames within your application may not be so accurate. Why? Well, the binaries in your application are stripped of any debug info, causing the on-device crash process to default to a simpler set of heuristics when unwinding. 
Without call frame information, libunwind effectively guesses where the frames are in very ambiguous cases. The symbolication quality is not optimal as well. Again, symbolication is the process of figuring out the symbol or function name that corresponds to a particular address. The on-device crash dump process only has access to the symbols that are present in the application's shared object symbol table. So this eliminates a lot of hidden visibility functions uh, and anything that's been inlined. In general, the more optimized the shared object is, the higher the chance of inaccuracy if debug information is absent. Lastly, there's also a lack of file and line number information, requiring the use of additional tools like add or to line. At the end of the day, however, a tombstone is much better than nothing. In the very first implementation of the Crashthetics NDK SDK, we tried to replicate exactly what the device does. We installed our own signal handler, and at crash time, it unwound the stacks and generated a report and sent that report to our backend for processing and analysis. Back in our familiar case, after a signal has been delivered to the application, our signal handler kicked in. It forked the process for the purpose of p-tracing it. It then used libunwind or libcorkscrew to unwind the stacks. Since unwinding was happening at crash time, we took advantage of DL adder in order to symbolicate the unwound stacks. A nice consequence of this is symbolicated system symbols. This mechanism is very similar to what the device does. But what do you really get? Well, you get the same accuracy as the on-device crash dump process, including system symbols. This is almost expected because the mechanisms are very, very similar. However, you get low reliability. Why is that? Well, as it turns out, the POSIX standard says that you can't really do anything useful inside a signal handler. You can't allocate memory. You can't acquire a mutex. All of your functions need to be re-entrant and async safe. And you can't even access or store any global state. We went to great lengths to ensure that our SDK was in line with most of the POSIX requirements. However, libunwind itself was not written to be re-entrant or async safe. Ultimately, our first attempt resulted in an unreliable experience for our customers. Another major downside of this approach are various security challenges. Executing code inside of a crashed context can easily hit undefined or unspecified behavior that can lead to all sorts of exploits. The rule of thumb is to minimize the amount you do inside a signal handler, and we were doing way too much. Even if we were successful in rewriting libunwind in a re-entrant and async safe manner, we'd still be doing too much in the signal handler. So the Crashthetics team decided to explore a different approach. We took advantage of BrakePad, an open source crash capture project. Back to our familiar scenario, the application has just received word from the operating system about accessing protected memory. This time, however, it's the BrakePad client that handles the signal. Instead of trying to unwind the crash at crash time, BrakePad's goal is just to capture the state of stack memory. Unwinding can be done outside of the crash context. The state of all threads is written into the minidump format. This modus operandi greatly reduces the amount of work being done inside the signal handler. However, the mini dump must now be processed, unwound, and symbolicated. Whereas before DL adder provided some way to get on device symbols, the mini dump must necessarily be paired with a symbol file in order to facilitate symbolication. Okay, this seems better, but what do you really get? Well, unfortunately, there's potential for inaccuracy for system frames and a complete lack of system symbols. This is unlike the on-device report and the first version of Crashlytics. Since unwinding takes place on the back end, there's no way to access any of the debug information that is available for system libraries on device. Capturing that information at crash time or before crash time would be way too costly. It's also impractical for the developer to upload this information via symbol files. They'd have to do it for all versions of Android for all vendors. This is a huge amount of work. 
Contrary to the on-device crash report and the first version of Crashlytics, you do get very accurate application frames when the backend mini dump processing is paired with the breakpad symbol file. The breakpad symbol file contains very robust symbol information and contains call frame information that guides the unwinding process in figuring out where frames are. You also get increased reliability because less is done on the signal handler. Of course, this comes at the expense of a very complex backend, but let Crashlytics worry about that. Although BrakePad reduced the amount of work being done on the signal handler, it was still doing way too much. The Crashlytics team decided to experiment with CrashPad. Similar to BrakePad, CrashPad is an open source crash reporting project that shares much of the BrakePad tooling. The principal difference, though, is the Crash Capture client. CrashPad's crash capture mechanics are fundamentally different than those of BrakePad. Once again, we're back in our app that's being scolded by the operating system. In this case, a very lightweight signal handler launches a brand new healthy process coined the trampoline. This is done via the on-device linker or the app underscore process process, depending on which version of Android the app is running on. Then it waits. The trampoline loads a shared object that contains the CrashPad client. Similar to BrakePad, the CrashPad client captures the necessary memory and writes it out to the mini dump. Okay, so this is tricky and very similar to BrakePad, but what do you really get? Well, since debug information is still missing from system libraries, there's some potential for inaccuracy within system frames. And system symbols are just completely missing, just like with the BrakePad client. Paired with the breakpad symbol file, the app frames are very accurate. Again, this is due to the robust nature of the breakpad symbol file and the presence of call frame information. What else do you get? While well, CrashPad is much more reliable than breakpad, it achieves this by doing much less in the signal handler and most of its work in a fresh, brand new, healthy process. One of the more ambitious design goals for CrashPad was to reduce the amount of work done in the signal handler to just a single system call. Right now it's at three or four, but it's getting there. Due to the mechanics of CrashPad, it's also able to capture more categories of crashes. BrakePad's in-process nature creates some problems for some categories of crashes on newer Androids. For example, Sigabort on Android 10 Plus devices. Ultimately, with CrashPad, you get a more reliable crash capture client that prioritizes application frame accuracy. Hopefully, you all have a deeper understanding of NDK crash handling, a better idea of what the device does, what Crashlytics does, and what the strengths and shortcomings of each are in solving this tough problem. I'd like to leave you with my top four takeaways. The first one is that the device crash report may have app frame inaccuracy stemming from lack of app debug info on the device. Now Crashlytics deals with this by collecting the debug information for all of your app's binaries via our symbol upload process. The second is the more you do in the signal handler, the less reliable it'll be. Third is capturing system symbols is a hard task. And the last is that Crashlytics has found CrashPad to be a more reliable and accurate NDK crash capture client. This is what's powering the latest version of the Crashlytics NDK SDK. I encourage you to give it a try and let us know about your experience. As far as what's next for Crashlytics, well, there are a few things that are top of mind for us. The first one, predictably, is system symbols. We're exploring ways to get this working. Uh, in tricky crashes, system symbols come in very handy. Easier symbol upload, especially for projects where the native code is built outside of the main application. And finally, better root cause analysis. A lot of issues stem from memory corruption. We'd like to make it easier to identify the root cause of that corruption. Not only will we help you capture the crash, but we'll try to help you fix it. Again, I encourage you all to give Crashlytics NDK SDK a shot and let us know what you think. Thanks for listening.